Uh, my name is Jim Wallace. I've been work working in Los Angeles County for about 25 years, working investigations, just a bit mostly of murders that are unsolved. Those are called cold case murders, right? And those are murders that really um, are un unsolved for a reason. There was something about them that was difficult. The evidence wasn't great. Had the evidence been great, they would have got solved 30 years ago. But it, now it's something that's slightly amiss, and we have to figure out what the solution is. And most of my career, I can tell you, I was not a believer. I wasn't raised in a Christian setting. I wasn't uh, around a lot of Christians growing up. And the only Christians I knew were at work, and a lot of those guys were not really able to defend what they believed. So if you ask them why this case should turn out a certain way and why they thought this suspect was the guy who did the murder, they could tell you that. And they could buy, you know, make five points, ten points why they think he's the guy. But if you asked them to give you five reasons why Christianity was true, five reasons why I should accept that the scriptures are reliable, five reasons why I should believe that Jesus rose from the dead, they couldn't give you two. And I thought, that's not really great, right? I mean, you have this one approach to your work that seems to be very different to your approach to your faith, and you would even say that your faith's more important to you than your work. So I don't understand that, right? And the other group, of course, that we knew were, were just the people we were taking to jail because a lot of those folks would tell us that they were Christians. And I thought, really? So I don't want any part of this anyway. I don't want to be the guy who doesn't even know why it's true. I don't want to be the guy who's living like it's not true. I just didn't want any part of it. And so I stayed, for the most part, out. And then I thought at some point, when my wife Susie finally convinced me to go to church, that I could at least look at the Gospels using the skill set that I had developed as a detective. And that's what we're going to do today. Because I think it'll help you to see what I saw. Now, my son is still doing the same job that I've been doing for years. And he's wearing the same outfits that I wore, right, the same uniform. And he has my name. I always say that we're like the George Foreman of law enforcement. We use that name over and over. Do you guys know who George Foreman is? He's a boxer. And he was, you know, a huge, uh, just a scary boxer, really. He was so powerful. And he had six sons. And he named them all... George Foreman. Yeah, that's true. We do the same thing because he's been wearing the same name tag that I'm using the same tools that I've used, same badge, but slightly different um, patch. And I did the same thing my dad did. His name's also Jim Wallace, and he worked at the same agency, slightly different patch. <laughs> Again, we're George Foreman, right? I'm telling you, I wasn't kidding. And so for the last, you know, 57 years, coming up on 58 years, we have been working at this agency with the same name. If you called our agency in the last nearly 60 years and asked for Officer Jim Wallace, there's been someone there to answer the phone. <laughs> Only it's this kid right now. So now we're not all believers. I, my son and I were believers, but my dad, was, was, again, I wasn't raised in a Christian setting. He's a very committed atheist. And I just want to kind of walk through some of the reasons so that all of us might reject a truth claim and then why we might believe something is true on the basis of evidence. Now, I'm going to, well, I brought books, but I, I, as a, as a non-Christian, I used to always be suspicious of Christians that were selling stuff, right? So God's got a sense of humor because years later, I'm a Christian selling books, right? <laughs> so I brought books, but they sold out which is okay, because I'm going to send you anyway. I didn't really come here to sell you books. I came here to provide you with good reasons to believe this is true. And you're going to get them from a website. We have a phone app, by the way, you can also download, and everything that's on our website is on the phone app. But you can reach me that way, too, also by social media. But I'm going to send you a link at the end that will have everything you need to take another step. The longer version of this video of this service I'm going to send to you because we're not going to be able to cover all of it in one service. I'm going to send you PDF files that you can read and download and keep. And I'm going to send you MP3s you can listen to, uh, like podcasts. Okay, I'm going to send all that stuff to you. You can download it and keep it, because I want you to be able to make the case for what you believe. I was challenged to do this a couple of years ago in that movie that we were talking about, God's Not Dead 2. They gave me six minutes to make a case for the reliability of Scripture in just six minutes. That's not easy to do, by the way. It's like doing it on Twitter. You got 140 characters, not 280. You know, knock it out. Well, it's hard to do that. So it's, it's, it's something you have to kind of, I want to give you enough information so that if someone asked you to make a case in six minutes, you'll have something to say. Does that make sense? So you won't be one of those guys who can give five reasons why your favorite team is going to make it to the playoffs, but you can't give me five reasons why the New Testament is reliable. And by the way, that's a lot of us. Would you agree? So we need to change that. I'm going to teach you about the forms of evidence first. There's only two kinds of evidence we use to make criminal cases. Direct evidence and indirect evidence. That's it. There's only two forms. Direct evidence is one kind of thing. Eyewitnesses. 
if we have an eyewitness who saw the crime occur, we can actually call that witness into trial and he, they can testify. If we don't have an eyewitness, which is about 70% of cases, and all of my cases, no eyewitnesses, we have to make it a different way, using indirect evidence, because everything else is indirect. DNA, indirect. Fingerprints, indirect. Behaviors, indirect. Statements made, indirect. The only thing that counts as direct evidence is eyewitnesses. Got it? Now, indirect evidence is also called circumstantial evidence. And when you hear that term, you're already thinking that's the junk evidence. You know what I mean? Like, that's just a circumstantial case. All they've got is a circumstantial case. How many times have you heard it that way? Well, that's a really a lie about the nature of circumstantial evidence. I want to teach you how this works. Let's do a case together. This is a young man who has been accused of killing his girlfriend with this baseball bat. Now, he does have feet, although you can't see them in any of these, really, can you? Dang, I should have made him up wear white tennis shoes. I need to change that, but... He's been accused of killing his girlfriend with that baseball bat, and if we're going to make this case as a direct evidence case, we would need an eyewitness, somebody who could say they saw him kill her. Now, if there was somebody like that, somebody who's across the street, we could ask that person questions. What happened on that day? Well, I, I was out you know, trimming my, my roses, and I heard the argument. My uh, neighbor is a very sweet girl, but she's constantly arguing with her boyfriend. And sure enough, on this day, they were arguing, and I heard the argue escalate this argument. And I look up, and I see them through the plate glass window on her house, and they are, he's now punching her. He punched her in the face, like twice. She went to the ground. He got a baseball bat out. He started beating her with a baseball bat. I couldn't believe it. He ran to his car. He drove off. You saw that? Yep, I saw all of it. Well, do you happen to know who that guy is? Oh, yeah, I know him. You know his name? Oh, yeah. How do you know this guy? Well, I've known both those people since they were this tall. This is a very small neighborhood. We're all, we all know each other. And I watched them grow up together. They dated through high school. They've been together forever. I've known him so well. We do, like, block parties, 4th of July. As a matter of fact, on the day of the murder... This guy was wearing the shirt that I gave him for Christmas. Now, that's a good witness, right? And if this witness stands up under cross-examination, you can make the entire case on the basis of one piece of evidence, the eyewitness testimony of this neighbor. This would be called a direct evidence case. This is what they look like. Make sense? Let's change it. What if on the day of the murder, he is not wearing a shirt that she gave him for Christmas? And in addition, he now has a mask over his face when he's committing the crime. So all she can say is, well, he's about the right weight, about the right build, about the right height as the guy I know who's her boyfriend, but I can't tell you for sure if it was her boyfriend because he had a mask on his face. Are you willing to convict him right now on that basis? He is, after all, the same size and weight and height as the boyfriend. No, I don't think we're going to do that, right? We need something more. But now we don't have a direct evidence case. We have to build this case some other way with indirect evidence. So we're going to knock on his door. We'll ask him, hey, what were you doing? In an interview, we'll ask him, what were you doing on the day of the murder? And he'll tell us, oh, yeah, I was out drinking with two of my friends. Really, what are their names? We go out and we interview his friends, and he's lying. He wasn't with them. And they tell us he hasn't seen this guy in weeks. So now he fits the general description, and he's lying about his alibi. Now, how many do you think he's our guy? Raise your hand. Not that you would convict him, just that you think he's our guy. Raise your hand. Okay, now how many of your hands raised would convict him? Not as many. Let's go a little further. We'll do a search warrant at his house. We find he's got a baseball bat. Matches the description of the baseball bat seen in the crime. Okay. On the thick part of this bat, it's all nicked up and dinged up like he's been using it to hit something solid or hit other things. So he's been using it as a club, not as a baseball bat. And... When we examine the club to see if it's got any blood or uh, tissue or uh, hair, it's clean because he has soaked his baseball bat in bleach. Can you think of a reason why an innocent person would have a baseball bat that he bleaches? So now you have a bleach bat, a bio alibi, and he fits the general description. How many of you think he's our guy? Raise your hand. More. Let's go a little further. In his house, he also has a pair of, of jeans. These jeans are dirty. But at the knees, they're clean, and they luminesce at the knees. That's a chemical we use, luminol. We spray it on certain surfaces, and sure enough, if it's body fluids or certain detergents, it'll glow. It'll luminesce. And it is glowing at the knees. 
We do a test for blood. It's not blood. As a matter of fact, whatever's been on those pants has been successfully cleaned off the pants. All that's left is the residue of the detergent. The pants are still covered in mud and dirt, right? So why is he spot cleaning something off the pants? If he wants to just get the dirt off, just wash the pair of pants. He's interested in something other than dirt that's on the pants that he actually was able to clean off. So now I've got bleached pants, I've got uh, uh, spot clean pants, bleached bad, B.O. alibi, fits the general description. No sign of forced entry at the house. Whoever got in this house did not to kick a door in or break a window. They were either let in voluntarily, the boyfriend would have been let in voluntarily, or they had a key to get in, and there's only three people who had a key. Only three. The boyfriend had a key, the deceased had a key, and the deceased mom, who died a couple months earlier, she also at one time had a key. That's it. So now he matches that description too. How many of you think he's our guy now? Raise your hand. What's wrong with the rest of you people? <laughs> I always make this claim because it's true. You know, and here we're in Wyoming. This is a pretty conservative state, I think. You guys are ready to convict this poor guy. In California, no, one's, no hand goes up in the air at all. No one wants to convict this poor guy in California. In Texas, he's already dead. He's been executed, okay? <laughs> so I think, I, I think I, it's just fair to say that in this range of jurors who like to kill people, you're closer to Texas than California. Would you agree? Okay. And the people who are still holding out, you're like, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna agree yet because Jim's got all that black area over there that he has to fill in still. So I'll just wait and see what's over there. Well, we do an interview with this guy and he admits that he has a bad temper and he admits that in his relationship with her, he has struck her on occasion and he doesn't like that part of his personality. And in the interview, he says, look, I don't like that and I always apologize afterwards and she always accepts my apology because I feel like, hey, this is just who I am. I get, lose my temper. And she always forgives me. And on the day of the murder, I will admit I lost my temper. And I did threaten to kill her in front of her friends. They're probably telling you that, but I, I did not kill her. I, did I punch her? Yeah, I punched her, but I did not kill her. How many of you now think he's our killer? Raise your hand. All the dads just raise their hands, right? Because <laughs> this is your daughter. You're, you're already ready to get rid of this guy. The witness says he ran out of the, the house with a certain kind of work boot. It's an unusual description of a work boot. It's got a vertical band on the outside of the boot. You do a little research, you find out there's only one manufacturer of that kind of a work boot. Only one model even matches that description. It's not a popular model. They only sold like 30 pairs in two years. And who do you think's got one of those 30 pairs in his closet? Our guy. Do you see what's happening here? He's got a one in 30 relationship to the boots. Only 30 of them out there. He's got a one in three relationship to the key. What are the odds that one of these three is also one of these 30? Do you see what happens in these cases? Not only that, if we'd have come a little later, he would have already been dead because he was getting ready to commit suicide. We know that because on the counter at the search warrant, we discover a suicide note in his handwriting, but it's not completed because we got there a little bit too early. In the suicide note, he says that he did something horrific on the day of the murder, something he cannot forgive himself for. He, he lost his temper. He exploded. He did something he cannot take back. He's changed history. He, just, he can't live with himself. But because you got there too early, he doesn't finish the note. Nowhere in the note does it say that the thing he did that was so horrific is that he killed his girlfriend. And the witness says when he drove out, he drove out in an unusual car. Probably not many of these in Wyoming because of the weather. But we have a few in California still. And she describes it like an early 70s model of Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Right? Do you guys know what a Carmen Ghia is? Okay, raise your hand if you know what the Carmen Ghia is. Raise your hand. These are the walking dead, okay? These are people who are so old... <laughs> that they remember what a Carmen Ghia is, okay? Be praying for those people, okay? They could stroke out before we're even done with the service, okay? And so you do a DMV search, and there's like, like three operational Volkswagen Carmen Ghias anywhere in the state, right? But when you get to his house and you pull up in the garage door, what do you think he's got? He's got himself a 1972 yellow, matches the color, Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Now, at this point, it's fair for us to ask the question, is it possible that he's innocent? Yes, because we don't care about possible. Anything and everything is possible. If you said to me, Jim, is it possible X? I'm always gonna say yes, because it's always possible. But it's not reasonable. And the judicial standard is not beyond a possible doubt, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. For a reason. You can never get beyond a possible doubt. It's possible you're not here right now. 
It's possible this is, does, this, none of this has been true. From the point you were born, it's all been a matrix experience. You haven't been given the pill yet. That's possible. It is. There are, there are serious university professors, philosophers who believe that the entire universe is nothing more than a computer simulation. Seriously. And that is possible. But it's not reasonable. And that's why we reject such things. Same here. I could say, well, look, I can find an ex a reason to explain that, some crazy explanation for this and a crazy explanation for this. They're all unrelated to each other, by the way. Eight crazy explanations over here for this and an explanation over here for that, an explanation over here for that. Don't get distracted by that because there's a better explanation for all of this evidence. It's the guy sitting in the middle who is the one common causal factor that unifies all the evidence. He's either incredibly unlucky that the stars have aligned perfectly to make him look guilty when he's innocent, or he's incredibly guilty. That's the difference. You see what we just did here? This is called a circumstantial case, a cumulative circumstantial case. All my cases are just like this. I've never had a direct evidence case. You know why? Because when you have an eyewitness, the dude probably takes a plea be uh, deal before we get to trial. It's just, it, it takes an offer. We don't go to trial for those kinds of cases. We go to trial for these kinds of cases. So my, all my cases are like this. This is, I've never lost a case. This is how you make cases. They are very, very compelling. And when we do these in front of a, a, a jury, we do them in a way that is just like this. This is from the illustration from Cold Case Christianity. I was telling people earlier that my background before I became a detective is so I have a bachelor's degree in fine arts, and then I have a master's degree in architecture from UCLA. <laughs> So if you're planning on being an architect, see me. I will warn you not to be an architect. Architorture. But this, I call this in front of a jury. If we use this kind of approach, we'd have 100 pieces of evidence that point to the same guy. And that's why I call this death by a thousand paper cuts, okay? Because one of these doesn't seem all that powerful. It's just a little paper cut. But when you have the cumulative case, it's very powerful. I like these kinds of cases because judges instruct jurors all the time. And they will tell them that you are to treat circumstantial evidence the exact same way you treat direct evidence. As a matter of fact, this is the instruction in California. Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable types of evidence. Neither is entitled to any greater weight than the other. So stop saying all they have is a circumstantial case, unless you're willing to say is all they have are five eyewitnesses, which you wouldn't say. But these are to be treated the same, no greater weight. Also, I like these cases better for a reason, because eyewitnesses, alleged eyewitnesses, lie all the time, all the time. They want to help their brother who's been accused of a murder. They want to, whatever the reason, they want to be on a Dateline episode with you, okay? All my cases end up on Dateline, all right? So they want to be on Dateline. They'll say anything to be on Dateline. Really? It's not that big a deal, okay? It's not worth perjuring yourself to be on Dateline. But they'll do it. Now, indirect evidence cannot lie. It's not lying to you. You might misinterpret it, but it's not trying to deceive you. Witnesses often are. That's why I don't trust witnesses. I learned a long time ago, never trust an eyewitness. You test eyewitnesses. Now, if they pass the test, I will trust them. But I don't just trust them blindly. When I was 35 years old and for the first time was looking at the... I didn't own a Bible until I was 35. But I went out and bought a Bible because this pastor at a big church in Southern California, he pitched Jesus in a way that I could catch him. He said, Jesus of Nazareth? That's the smartest dude who ever lived. Smartest man ever lived. The entire Western civilization has been built on the moral teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm thinking, I'm enforcing laws that this dude is telling me came out of the mouth of Jesus of Nazareth. That's no way. So I bought a Bible to see if that was true. And I thought, I'm going to test the eyewitnesses. I'm going to test the people who claim to see Jesus to see if they could pass this test. And this test is pretty specific. It is 14 questions we allow jurors to ask whether they're listening to eyewitnesses on the stand. It comes down to these four broad categories to make it easier for you. The question is, was the witness there and could really see what he said he saw? If he's not even in the state at the time, he can't be a witness. Can he be corroborated in some way? Um, has he been honest and accurate over time or has he changed his story? And finally, does he have a bias? These are the four basic categories we're trying to look at in eyewitness reliability. Could we apply that to the gospel authors? I think you could. That's what we're going to do right now. First, were they there early enough to have seen what they said they saw? 
This is a guy who confessed to a crime in our city in 1972 the crime occurred. This is now 1974. This is my dad. I think it's a great picture of my dad. He, he, he looks ridiculous. By the way, he's got that mustache right there, right? Okay, no one wears a mustache without any other facial hair. Okay, I'm sorry. It's true. Does anybody now today wear just a mustache without any other face? No. You have to have a goatee or something. If you're a guy right now in this room who has got just a mustache and no other facial hair, raise your hand. Raise your hand. <laughs> raise your hand. There they are. Old guys. See what I said? <laughs> I rest my case. Gentlemen, it's time for you to shave that off <laughs> or grow it in because that does not work, okay? I don't even think it worked in 1974, but that's the only issue. But here's this guy. He confessed to this crime. It was a horrific crime of a 10-year-old girl in our city. A ten, about a thousand, about a thousand-page transcript of this uh, interview with this lady right here and this guy right here with a kind of cool sideburn. None of it's true. He wasn't even there. It's all a lie. We got rid of him at the very last minute. He's not our killer. You can't be the killer. He, he's, a, he's got some other issues, okay? But he's not our killer. And he confessed to this thing for who knows why, but he's not the guy. You can't be the killer if you weren't there, but you also can't be a witness if you weren't there. And that was my suspicion about the gospel authors. Here they are reporting an event, the ministry of Jesus. It doesn't make it into the official canon of the church. In other words, there's, it doesn't really become sanctioned as a New Testament account until the Council of Laodicea. 330 years later, if it's written late in history, like over here somewhere, we cannot consider it an eyewitness account. Matthew could say he saw that stuff. John can say I saw that stuff. <laughs> Don't care. It's written too late. These people have been dead. The eyewitness. By the way, if you want to lie about Jesus, wait until everyone dies. You can say anything you want. Over here, you can say anything you want about Jesus. No one would know any better. Over here, it's harder because the people who would know better would call you out. Make sense? So a lot of skeptics like Bart Ehrman, who is leading the Bible department at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and has written all these really good books that are great bestsellers, new, like New York Times bestsellers, he does not believe any of this is true. He's a biblical scholar. He was raised in the church, raised in youth groups, he went to Moody Bible Institute, went to Wheaton College, went to Princeton, walked away from the faith, and now has written a number of books like this one, How Jesus Became God, Forged, Misquoting Jesus. Can you see the problem here? People like this believe that these were written too late. If they're right, we should stop meeting on Sunday. We're wasting a lot of good time. On the other hand, if they're dated over here, especially over here in this area, well, then they could at least pass the first test. They might still be lies, but they're early lies, and that's a lot harder to do. So the question I had, first off, is were they early enough to really be eyewitness accounts? They are. I'm going to make a circumstantial case. There's a book that Luke wrote about what happened to the disciples after they ascended into heaven. It's called the book of Acts. And Luke wrote this book, and he described everything that happened in the area around uh, the Mediterranean and the area around Jerusalem, yet he leaves out key things. I don't know why he would leave these things out. One of the things he leaves out is the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. That was horrific. It's recorded by historians, but not by Luke. The siege of Jerusalem that occurred before, horrific. They starved out the inhabitants. When the Roman guards kicked down the walls and entered, people had died of starvation. One woman was found to be eating, according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, one woman was found to be eating her own child to stay alive. It's missing from the book of Acts. Nothing in the book of Acts about this. If you were doing a history of New York City and you decided to leave out the Twin Towers, I would want to know why you left it out. Also, Paul's still alive at the end of the book of Acts. We know when he died, died in Rome in the 60s. Peter's still alive at the book of, end of the book of Acts. There's no description of the death of James, the brother of Jesus. All of these key players in the book of Acts, they all died. We know when they died, where they died, and how they died. Yet Luke says nothing about their death. He mentions the death of James, the brother of John. That occurred in 44 AD. That is a nobody, okay? Why would you even mention him? When the brother of Jesus who led the biggest church, you leave him out? Why would these things be missing? Well, one possible explanation it may not be reasonable, but it's at least possible, is that 
This has all been written before any of this stuff happens. If Acts is written over here, we're already pretty close. Well, then that would explain why this is all missing. But there's other internal evidence also. Luke wrote two books. Not going to trick you here. The other book was called The Gospel of Luke, right? And he wrote that book first. So that means we have to date it over here. Now we're getting really close. The reason why we know he wrote that book first is because he tells us this in the first chapter of Acts. He has a former book where he's describing all that Jesus began to do. Remember, Luke was a witness to all the stuff that happened in Acts. He was with Paul. But over here, Luke is not a witness. He has to interview the eyewitnesses. Make sense? Now, there's clues that can help us know if this is true. Here's one in 1 Timothy. You may have been reading past this and never noticed it, but here it is. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, take care of your church leaders. They deserve to be compensated. I know this because my Bible tells me so. The scripture says this, and he gives you two verses of scripture to prove his point. The first one is, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. That's in Deuteronomy. Old Testament passage. But Paul's always using Old Testament passages. Who cares? It's the next line that's interesting. Because that's not an Old Testament passage, and he's calling it scripture. The scripture says this. That passage is from the Gospel of Luke. He's quoting Luke's gospel as scripture as early as the 60s. How long does it have to be there before something is accepted as scripture that gets around the block in all the Mediterranean and becomes known as scripture? Also, though, I said it's 53. This is 63. There's another passage where he's writing to the church in um, the uh, Corinthian church and trying to remind them how to properly do the Lord's Supper. And he says, go back to the way I taught you, And he's teaching them from one passage where Jesus says, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Only one gospel author says that. John's version of the Lord's Supper does not include that passage. Matthew's version does not include that passage. Mark's version doesn't include that passage. He's quoting line for line again out of Luke's gospel, his good buddy, the doctor. Only now he's calling it out as a scriptural example to the Corinthian church as early as 53. And by the way, he's reminding them of how he taught them when he planted the church around 51. So how much earlier is this? I don't know. But that's not a bad guess. And it supports all this other stuff. All makes sense if this is true. And in the first verse of Luke's gospel, he gives away another clue. Because we always look at the words that are not necessary. This is called forensic statement analysis. I'm looking for deception indicators, compression of time, expansion of time, little clues, usually the things you don't have to say but you say anyway. That's what will give you away. That means adjectives and adverbs, they're never needed. So if you use an adjective or an adverb, I'm going to be looking at it. My kids, by the way, hate this. Okay, they hate this. (laughs) But here he uses three adjectives or adverbs. Here's an adverb. Why would he say that? You don't need to say that. Leave it out. I've investigated everything from the beginning. He's talking to the eyewitnesses. I get it. He's a good detective. But why call it careful? Because there's another early account out there that's not quite as careful. It's called the Gospel of Mark. Have you read it? Have you compared Mark to Luke? Mark's a contemporary of Luke's. They knew each other. But Mark's account's a lot shorter. He also uses this expression, most excellent. Theophilus is a leader in the early region. We're not quite sure who he is, but apparently he's pretty excellent. But this one was really was interesting to me because this made sense of this word. This is, means correct chronological order. Why would you put that in there? You know you're writing a history of Jesus. Histories are in the right order. Who puts a history and scrambles it up and says, you figure it out? No. History start, and this thing starts with the birth of Jesus and ends with the death and ascension of Jesus. I'm kind of assuming this stuff in the middle is in the right order, right? Only here he's saying, no, my stuff's in the right chronological order. Why would you need to do that? Again, you might say this if there's another early account out there that's different than yours. And there is. It's called the Gospel of Mark. Not only is it shorter, it's not in the same order as Luke. Really? Because Papias, a bishop in the first century, second century, says that Peter was preaching in Rome. Mark is writing out Peter's memoirs, basically. And Papias says that Mark's account is accurate, if not orderly, and he uses the same word. So we have an early account that we know is not in the right order, and one that is. But that means he has to have access to the disorderly account, which he does, and that puts Mark first. And most scholars will put Mark or Matthew first. I'm not even going to get into Matthew at this point. 
I'm only tracing it through Luke's God. It all starts here. We get a good date for that. We work backwards. Here we are. We are way too early. They passed the first test. Doesn't mean they're true. When we look at timelines and criminal investigations, we're trying to figure out, is the bad guy available to do the crime? Here, we're trying to figure out, are the eyewitness accounts, are those people available to have written eyewitness accounts? And they are. Now the question becomes the second piece we're not going to even talk about because this takes forever. This is the part I'm going to send to you in a larger video, okay? This allows us to get out of here on time. We're going to hop down to the bottom. This really bugged me because I've done a lot of cases like this is another Dateline case where this guy killed his wife in 1981 and he got rid of her body and he claimed that she just ran off. We had a no body missing for 25 years. We never did discover the body. And we caught him, though, because he would change his story over the years because he couldn't remember his first lie. It's one thing to go back in your mind's eye and recall what really happened, but if it was all a lie from the beginning, it's hard to go back there. There's no there to go back to. And he would make up a new lie. And eventually that gave him away. And I thought the same thing could be happening with the Gospels. You have, I don't care if they're written really early in history over here. You have an event, and eventually it gets into the canon of Scripture. There's a long time between these two things. How do I know what happened in here? Maybe the first story of Jesus is very simple. It's an early story. He's a preacher. He preaches the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about some things, but he doesn't ever do a miracle, never heals anybody, never was born of a virgin, didn't rise off the, off the, out of the grave, didn't ascend into heaven. All that stuff got added over time. Distortions of the Jesus account. The legend of Jesus grew until, as Bart Ehrman says, the Jesus of Nazareth became the Christ of Christianity. Hmm, that's what I thought too. Now, something happens similarly in criminal scenes, right? You have a scene, you go to court 30 years later. I'm in court, I say, ladies and gentlemen, I have a piece of evidence, a casing that was at the original crime scene. Here it is today, right before your eyes. And on the casing, you will see an extractor pin mark. That extractor pin mark matches the extractor pin of the handgun used by the defendant. This is the piece of evidence that demonstrates that he is the killer. Really? How do you know that that extractor pin mark you see today was there back in the beginning? For all you know, somebody pulled that out of property years later and etched in the extractor pin mark, put it back in property. Now, the people who follow him have no idea this has been altered. And when I finally get it, I don't have no idea it's been altered. I bring it into trial, but it's very different than it was originally, and no one's the wiser. Couldn't something similar happen with the Gospels? You have this Gospel, so you have John, and you bring it in the trial later on into the council. How do I know how many times it was changed? There's 330 years to play with, and there's no social media to report this stuff. So it could be changed a thousand times. All that stuff gets added to the Gospels. And the people who come in and bring it into the council are just like me. They have no idea that it's been changed. And now I have something that's not true in your canon of Scripture. Now, we have a way of testing this at crime scenes. Let's go through that real quick. At the crime scene, we can ask the question, was there an officer there back in 1980 who saw that thing? Yeah. Did he take a, a picture of it? Did he write about it in a supplemental report? Did he describe in his report that it had an extractor pin mark on it? Did the Polaroid, you guys know what a Polaroid is? Okay, it's the last service. We can go a little long. I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you a test to see if you know what a Polaroid is. How many of you guys know this Polaroid? <laughs> Wait for it, wait for it. It develops, right? Raise your hand if you've touched that, used that kind of camera. Raise your hand. Okay, that's almost everybody. How about this? <laughs> oh, that's right. You couldn't touch that thing. If you touched it, your thumbprint would be on it, right? That's a slightly older kind of Polaroid. How many of you guys used that kind of camera? Raise your hand. Smaller group, right? Okay. <laughs> they used to have a top on them. Do you remember that? How many of you used that kind of camera? Older. Okay. How about this? We used to put the solution on the film so it would develop. Raise your hand if you're those people. Same guys who had mustaches, okay? They were all driving Carmen Gias, I'm sure. Be praying for them before they die. The question is, do we have a Polaroid here 
something that shows if it was there. And then he's going to give it to someone like my dad. My dad's going to take another Polaroid back in those days because you couldn't wait for the 35 millimeter film to come back from the lab. It took forever. Or he's going to write his own report describing what he got from that officer. It's gonna, it should better say that it had an extractor pin mark on it. Then he's going to bring it to the crime lab. They're taking better pictures, making better reports. I'm going to get it. I'm going to make a report. I'm going to have report after report, picture after picture over time from the past to the present. And I better have a record of that extractor pin mark on every one of those. Like links in a chain that connect the past to the present, this is called the chain of custody. And in every criminal trial, you have to identify the chain of custody for every piece of evidence. Make sense? Is there a chain of custody for the New Testament? Yes, there is. Here's your crime scene. Here's your courtroom. First officer at the scene is a dude named John. He takes a picture of Jesus. It's called the Gospel of John. But how do I know what's in his Polaroid? What's in his supplemental report? Well, we ask the question, did he give it to anybody? Because the next person he gives it to should document it the exact same way. Well, it turns out John had three personal students, Ignatius, Polycarp, and Papias. These three students sat at the feet of John. If we didn't have John's record, we could ask them, what did John teach you? Was Jesus born of a virgin? Did he work miracles? Did he rise from the dead? Or was that stuff not, not part of his account? We actually still have the reports of these three men, because, or two of them at least, because they became leaders in the local church. We have seven letters written from Ignatius to local church members. And he quotes from all of his sources or alludes to them and describes Jesus in a particular way, the way he learned it from John. We don't have anything from Papias, but we do have one letter from Polycarp to the church in Philippi. We can compare these. How does this compare to this? How does this compare to this? How does this guy's compare to this guy's? See what we're doing here? These guys also had a student. Polycarp and Ignatius had a student named Irenaeus. Irenaeus was a huge leader in the early church. He wrote a ton of stuff. We still have all of it. I mean, virtually all of it. It's a really great record to have of his stuff. And he even has a list of 24 New Testament books. These are all the different books he quotes from and talks about. Don't let anyone tell you that a church council created the canon of Scripture. That's a lie. It is quoted immediately by the first officers in the chain of custody. It is assembled and listed hundreds of years before any church council. Got it? This is, goes right back to the eyewitnesses. There's also a, a student of Irenaeus. He taught a guy named Hippolytus who gets into some trouble, gets into custody. He ends up dying in custody. There's not a really, I don't have a really firm student of Hippolytus, so the chain of custody stops right here, but that's okay, because remember, in a chain of custody, what matters most are the earliest links. If the early links match the late links, you're good to go. Make sense? So there's two more chains of custody I draw in uh, Cold Case Christianity, one from Paul through his two students, Linus and Clement. They're mentioned in his letters. They became the first two bishops in Rome, all the way through the Roman bishop Tatian. It stops there. Here's another chain of custody from Peter. His first student is Mark. Mark hand selects the first five bishops in Alexandria, Egypt, and they become the church leaders in North Africa all the way through to Eusebius. Here's what's great about it. Three completely different regions in the world. Rome, Asia Minor, Africa, no way to talk to each other. Can't Snapchat each other, can't text each other. Hey, what are you saying about Jesus over there? Don't know. We can trace these three independent chains of custody. And if you lost all of the New Testament books and all you had were the first students of the New Testament authors, you'd be stuck with the same Jesus that you know today. Because that never changed. He has always been the born of a virgin, worked miracles, preached sermons, died on a cross, rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Nothing changes. It's early, and it never changes. In the end, I was able to check that box. But how about this last one, bias? We have a bar in our town where guys get drunk and accuse each other of things all the time. And when you get there, you're trying to figure out which one of you two knuckleheads is lying, right? Because only three things cause somebody to lie. The same three things that cause somebody to commit a murder. The same three things that cause you to sin. Only three things cause any stupid thing you've ever done. Did you know that? Here they are. This is motive. It all comes down to motive. And what motivates you to do stupid is one of three things. It's the pursuit of money. Money is behind a lot of stupid. The pursuit of relationships or sex. That's behind a lot of stupid. And the pursuit of power. That's behind a lot of stupid. There are, there's no fourth category, folks. There isn't. Now, this is actually supported in Scripture, but I didn't know the Scripture. I just discovered this working cases. Isn't it interesting, though, how Scripture describes the world the way it really is? Anyway, which of these three, then, are the disciples 
trying to get in their lie about Jesus? Are they trying to get rich? I don't think so. Are they trying to get girlfriends? I don't think so. Skeptics will say, though, they're probably trying to get power. The argument here is that the disciples would gain some status, some status in their own religious community if they could get this kind of story floating. So Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, he's trying to get power out of this. He started off as a religious person who was in power, as a religious Jew of the highest order, trained by one of the best rabbis in history. He is trained by that rabbi. He is so powerful that he is able to draw orders to have Christians executed. And you're telling me that one day he decides to jump out of that position of authority, power, and respect and get his rear end kicked all over the known world, tortured, starved, all the stuff he went through, so that someday he could get back to what he started with? I got an easier way for you, Paul. Just stay where you are. Now, it's possible that's what he's up to, but it's not reasonable because all of these folks died miserable ways. And if you were a leader in the Christian church in the first century, you were like this deer in this cartoon. That's a bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> that's what these guys had on their foreheads. Because they all died you know, pretty terrible deaths, refusing to change their story. Now, I bet you some of you in this room would say, I would be willing to die for what I believe as a Christian. So what? That would have no evidential value. People die all the time for what they do not, do not know is a lie. But this group would know if it's a lie. They're not like you or me. This group would be the one group that would know if the whole thing is a sham. You might decide, I, I will die for what I believe. Fine. Doesn't make, make it true. But if they're willing to die for this and they've got nothing to gain, I have to ask a different question. Do you see Why? We started off with this guy, and we asked the question, do we have enough reason to believe that he's our killer? And we made a case circumstantially, cumulatively. Now we're asking the question, are the Gospels reliable? Are they telling us something true about Jesus? We're going to make the case the same way. Only we're going to build this cumulative case on the basis of four pieces, four categories. First is, is it early enough to have been written by somebody who was really there? I think there's enough good reason to believe that's true. Then we ask the question, is it corroborated in any way? And I wish we could do one whole talk just on this. When I teach this class at Biola, it takes me 17 hours to teach this. So it takes a little more time than we probably have time for today. I always told the last group, this is evidence, right, that there is a God. Because I'm not going to force you through a 17-hour lecture. Therefore, there is a God. <laughs> but here, there's lots of things we could talk about. We didn't talk about any of these things. And we will have to just leave that for the video. And this is the third thing. Is it accurate and over time or has it changed? We've got a chain of custody. We can actually demonstrate that it hasn't changed. And finally, what would cause them to lie about this? You tell me. Death by a thousand paper cuts. This is how we make criminal cases. And when I got to this place, looking at the, the case for Jesus, I thought, okay. So what is it really? I have a need to know if I can make the case evidentially. Well, I can. So what's keeping you out? Is it that there's not enough evidence? Let me ask you that. If you're still somebody whose wife or husband is dragging you here, I get it. Or your parents are dragging you here. I even get that. What's keeping you out? There's not enough evidence for this? Oh, really? Or you just don't want there to be enough evidence for this? Which is it? There's enough evidence for this. The question is, are you willing to see it? I always say this. I am not a Christian because it works for me. Because it does not work for me. It doesn't. I had 18 years with Susie before we ever became Christians. We were together for 18 years. We had kids. Those years were easier, and she would say the same thing, than the 21 years since. They were easier, the first 18, because the standard was my standard. Whatever I thought I wanted to do, I never felt bad about doing anything. I was the only judge of what I did. This is a lot harder now because the standard is not me anymore. And I'm not a Christian because I was raised in a Christian setting because I wasn't. I'm not a Christian because I was a train wreck trying to stop drinking and beating my wife. I wasn't doing those things. We had a great life. There was nothing wrong with it. But I discovered at some point that this is true, and I knew I had to change it, even though there were going to be some inconvenient days. And in our culture, you're going to have some inconvenient days. 
But we have to be able to tell people why it's true. And it has to be, sadly, something other than, I've had a religious experience, or I was raised that way, which right now has been your answer. 80% of you, this has been your answer up until this moment. I've had an experience that demonstrated Christianity is true, or I was raised this way. By the way, my Mormon, I've got six brothers and sisters raised Mormon. Okay, my dad's second family. And I will tell you, that is their explanation also. They've had an experience that demonstrated the Book of Mormon is true, and they were raised in the church. You don't think what they believe is true. They give the same reasoning you do. We can do better. Let's bring it up right now and ask a few questions you have typed into your phone. Oh, it's a great time to uh, just go ahead and start texting those questions. But uh, we have some law enforcement officers here today. Excellent. And uh, one of them typed in the question, how has becoming a follower of Jesus shaped uh, what you do? It's, it's going to be hard at times, right? Because we, we know, look, I do a lot of talks now on, on um, Black Lives Matter, um, racism and police work. And I have to make my standard scripture. Not what you want to be true. Not what's been working for you and your agency. The standard has to be scripture. Or just do me a favor and stop calling yourself a Christ follower, please. But if we're Christ followers, the standard has to be scripture. I gotta bend my knee to that. And it, it'll make you an outcast for lots of other reasons. The first thing that changed for me was my language. Oh my gosh. I could use profanity in every form of, of English you could possibly use. Adverb, I got one of those. You need a noun or a verb, I got one of those. You need an adjective, I can get you one of those. Past participle, no problem, I can do that too. Because that was who I was. And I was you know, in, a, in a field where a lot of bad guys were talking that way too, and we all talk like bad guys before you know it. So as those things changed, I started to kind of rub up against some um, resistance. And, but that's okay, because my, my standard is no longer my peer group, it's no longer my agency, it's no longer the, 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 uh, the, the mission statement of my agency. My, my standard now has to be scripture. And if it's not scripture, no problem, just get out. Stop calling yourself a Christ follower. If you are a Christ follower, then you've got to submit yourself to what Christ says. That stinks, right? But it's true. So. So we live in a world... Mm -hmm. that says, if you told me you love me, you have to agree with everything that I say. That's, right. that's the world we live in. Your family has different beliefs. Mm -hmm. So how does loving Jesus help you navigate and just prove the depths of that love? I think we've, we've redefined this word we call intolerance. It's been redefined by culture. But it's not the classic definition of intolerance. The definition in the culture right now of intolerance is, of tolerance is, to tolerate somebody, you must agree and accept their behavior. Agree with and accept, affirm. That is not the definition of tolerance. You don't, get, you don't have to agree with somebody. Look, if you agree with them, you agree with them. There's no problem. You don't tolerate people you agree with. You agree with them. You tolerate people with whom you disagree. You can't be tolerant if you start agreeing. You want to tolerate somebody? Hold on to your disagreement. Because you have to have a disagreement first in order for you to exhibit tolerance. Let me give you permission for something right now. I want to give you permission. Uh, who am I to give you this permission? But I'll give it to you anyway. <laughs> to hate bad ideas. Because Jesus hated bad ideas. Pedophilia? Bad idea. I hope you hate it. But you are not allowed to hate the people who hold bad ideas. Right. We're called to love those people. This is the definition of tolerance. I hold on to my hate of the idea, but I love the person who holds it. Do you see the difference? It took me a while as a Christian to realize that that's the difference. To give myself permission to still hate sin. To hate the things that God hates. That's okay. If I have to love the things that God hates in order to be considered tolerant, something's wrong with the definition. That makes sense? Have you applied the same forensic um, methods to different religions? So when I uh, became interested in this, my Mormon family right away saw I was kind of starting to click on certain things, right? So I have a sister who was kind of living with us once in a while. She would hang out with us a lot. She's 15 years younger than I am. So she decides 
um, since I'm, you know, getting interested. Well, I'm not sure she did this or not, but suddenly we had a knock on the door and we had Mormon missionaries. I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know what was true, what wasn't true, but I got a Book of Mormon about the same time I got a Bible. And I started reading through the Book of Mormon. I didn't, it sounded like in King James, I'll tell you, it sounds a lot like Scripture because Joseph almost verbatim copied out of large pieces of Scripture when he wrote the Book of Mormon. There's entire chapters of Isaiah that are in the Book of Mormon, word for word, out of the King James. So, I mean, it sounded like it was similar. So I started applying the same process to the Book of Mormon and the claims of Joseph Smith simultaneous to the authors of the Gospels. The reason I'm not a Mormon today is because you can't do what we just did in the Book of Mormon. You can't. It doesn't work. It doesn't hold up. It falls apart really quick. So, so that's, that's why I'm not a Mormon today is because I did the same thing with this. And in my class, I have students, when they take the class at, at Biola, they have to write a paper in which they apply any four of the ten things I teach them in the book, any four of those they can apply to any historically grounded theistic system. There aren't a lot. Islam is another one that you can apply it to. So the students will write papers. We collect those papers. So I'm not the only one who's done that. But yeah, you can apply that to anything. Remember, we have a different... Do you realize how weird Christianity is? Nearly every other theistic worldview makes a series of claims like proverbial claims that cannot be tested. You cannot test the claims of Buddha. But you can uh, test the claims of Jesus because he claimed to rise from the dead in history. We have a faith system that can be falsified or verified in a way that Buddhism cannot be falsified or verified because it makes no claims about history. If the resurrection didn't occur, this is all a farce. We can test that. We didn't do that today, but we could test that. And that's why it's a very different kind of a system. But most theistic systems cannot be tested at all. We happen to be in one that... God wants us to know if this is really true. Make sense? And by the way, when you see differences between gospel accounts, do not let that bother you. That is exactly what eyewitness testimony looks like. Exactly. If you've ever worked with eyewitnesses, they never, ever, ever agree. Ever. The first thing I do when I get called out in the middle of the night is I tell the dispatcher, you've got cops there, right? Because I'm getting called out for a homicide. You got cops in place? Yes. Have them separate the eyewitnesses. That's the only request I have. Why? Because if I don't separate the eyewitnesses, they'll line up their statements. I don't want them to do that. I want the statements to seem different because my job is to put that together as a puzzle. And I don't want them trying to line up their statements. Our gospels look and feel exactly what I would expect them to look and feel like if they are actually eyewitness accounts. Somebody had a question they have found in just their own digging. Uh, they can find evidence of Peter's death and Paul's death, mm-hmm. but for the rest of the disciples, they're at a loss. Yes. Can you steer them in a certain... Uh, no, no problem. There's a great book called the, um, the Fate of the Apostles by Sean McDowell. It just came down in price. So it used to be an academic resource. He has gone out and looked at all the classic stories of antiquity about the deaths of the apostles. Some are better than others. I don't like most of them, to be honest. All that stuff we showed you, I think maybe three are very, very firm in history. There's a middle ground of a bunch that are not so firm in history. And there are three or four that I wouldn't even probably even accept. Here's what I do know, though. I know that the people who wanted to end Christianity were trying to get the earliest people who claimed it was true to recant. They were trying to do that. We see this. Pliny the Younger writes to Trajan. He says, I've got not a first-generation eyewitness, a second-generation eyewitness. I've got to, not an eyewitness, he's a second-generation believer. I got him to recant. He writes to Trajan to say, I got him to recant. They were trying to get all the Christians to recant, but they could never get any of the 12 to recant. There's no ancient document anywhere in which any of the 12 ever recanted. Look, there were three original alleged eyewitnesses of the Book of Mormon. Oliver uh, Cowdery, David Whitmer, Martin Harris. Those three originally, allegedly saw the Book of Mormon, the Golden Plates, yet all three left the church or were thrown out of the church. People who believe something is true don't go. They die with the claim. Those three didn't. Ask yourself. So a part of this is really, did they ever recant? They never recanted. Okay, I, because the sound is a little bit different back or weird back here, uh, if, you, if you've answered this, forgive me. Okay. Uh, one of the questions that's come up over and over and over again is, how long did it take to, for you to walk through the process, and at what point did you say, 
I can't deny this. So I didn't keep track of it because I never thought I would be a Christian. So I started, you know, this sometime, I think, and, and Susie will have to kind of correct me if I'm wrong. I think we started in 96. I think I was a Christian by 97. So about six months of, pro- I only know this because I know I have an ID tag serving in children's ministry that has the year 1997 on it. <laughs> so I know I was in by then. But, um, but, so by the way, she all served in children's ministry, in case you're wondering. Um, but the important thing was, it took about six months, I think, for me to, to go through this. I didn't have an instantaneous experience. And I am suspicious of people who do. I know that God works that way. I don't want to try to limit what the Holy Spirit can do. But all of my Mormon family have that instantaneous experience, so I'm always like, eh, can we just give me a little more? Because <laughs> I just need a little more, right? That makes sense? Okay, uh, last question, and I want to say thank you to you guys for yeah, sending for your question. There is, we could be here all day. Can, so you, can, can you help me thank think? You, thank you, thank you. Okay. That was for, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one more question. <clears throat> all right, so we've got an appetite, and we've learned, and we've had fun. How can we keep up with you? And just kind of tell us some of the things that you're doing these days, and then how we can keep up with you. Well, I'm not, I don't think you want to keep up with me. I'm not that important. But do this. Study. There's stuff that you have prioritized your time for that you know a lot about. I can tell you right now, I'm getting ready for the NBA Finals, right? We're a couple of games away from the NBA Finals. Why do I care so much? We get, turn on TV, and Susie will say, man, you know an awful lot about this team that's nowhere even near us. How do you know so much about the Oklahoma, uh, OKC? Or how do you know so much about Houston's players? I don't know. I just, I'm interested, I guess. It's stuck in there. Do you know how many gray brain cells are wasted on stuff that doesn't matter? And everyone in here has got some category that you have said, I'm interested in this thing that doesn't matter. Yet this, we don't, we don't give our, our time to this. If you know who the general manager is for your team, but you don't know who Papias was, something's wrong. It's really not about working harder. It's about working smarter. It's really not about saying, I, you're going to have to spend an extra 10 hours a week doing this thing. No. It's you're going to take that ten, two hours a week that you spend thinking about stupid stuff, and you're going to have to put it towards something that honors God. That's all it really is, is become obsessive with what you believe about God. And your kids will see it. And it'll rub off on your friends. Don't become weird. Just become knowledgeable. There's a difference. Sometimes all of us who are interested in apologetics, Christian apologetics, we're like a Star Trek convention, okay? You get us all together and we're like, you're wearing the wrong uniform. You're supposed to be in the ID lab. You're supposed to have blue, not red. Really, that's how weird we are. We know all these weird details. I'm not saying get weird. I'm saying get smart. That makes sense? All right, thanks, guys.